this is Psych Boost helping you with your psychology qualification one video at a time. This video is on neuropsychology and in this 20th GCSE video we'll be covering an introduction to neuropsychology. The very kind support of students and teachers who donate on Patreon help me help you by continuing to make these videos and resources. Very big thank you for all your help guys. To join them, follow the link. For everyone, you might want to check out the free worksheet for this video and the quiz. Here are the terms on the AQA GCSE specification we're going to cover in this video. As we go through the video, they'll be in red text and you need to be able to respond to questions on all of this. So let's start by defining cognitive neuroscience. You'll likely know that cognitive psychologists create theories on how information is processed in the brain. In the memory unit, we discuss the multi-store model of memory. Neuroscientists investigate the anatomical structures of the brain. So cognitive neuroscientists combine both of these fields, matching the physical structure of the brain with information processing functions. Fundamentally, cognitive neuroscientists explain how the structure and function of the brain is related to our behavior, what we do, and our cognition, what we think. An important aspect of this work is identifying the location of function. So, matching an ability to a particular location. The historical way of doing this research was by investigating abnormal people and their brains. If you had someone with damage to the brain, so a change to the structure, and they had a functional difference, then you could assume that the damaged part of the brain was responsible for that function. Some famous examples are Phineas Gage, who had a metal bar shot through his frontal lobe and then developed an aggressive personality. Clive Waring, who due to illness had damage to his hippocampus and then was unable to make any new long-term memories. And Tan, who had damage to a part of the temporal lobe, we now call Broca's area, and could only say Tan. There are problems with using abnormal brains to study brain function. The sample size is often only one person, so they may be unusual in other ways, and we're interested in how a healthy brain functions. Fortunately, we now have a range of scanning techniques that we can use to study the functioning living brain. We're going to look at three scanning techniques, CT, PET and fMRI. All three use a similar looking machine, but they use very different technology to produce their images. Starting with a CT scanner. CT stands for Computed Tomography. These scanners use a series of X-rays to produce a set of detailed black and white cross-sectional images showing the structure of the brain. A CT scan shows a very high level of detail. This gives researchers the ability to identify small, unusual structures. Another advantage is it's cheaper to perform a CT scan than a PET or an fMRI scan. However, there are some serious drawbacks to CT scans. As you can imagine, firing a large number of x-rays at someone's brain is a radiation risk. And while the images of brain structure are sharp, they don't show brain activity. PET scanners stand for Positron Emission Tomography. This scanner is made of a ring of sensors, and these sensors detect gamma rays. These gamma rays are often given off by a radioactive tracer that's injected into the patient's bloodstream. As more active areas of the brain require more blood to function, the researchers can identify more and less active parts of the brain. So we can see the big advantage that PET scanners have over CT scanners is they show the brain's activity useful for researchers studying brain function. However, while the radioactive traces have a low level of radioactivity, it's not perfectly safe. So there are only a limited number of scans a patient can have. The last scanner is the fMRI, standing for Functional Magnetic Resonance Imagery. This scanner uses large magnets to measure the difference between oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. As active brain regions need oxygenated blood, these areas show up in an fMRI scan. The advantages of fMRIs are that they show brain activity and they don't have the dangers of using radiation. But the downsides of fMRI scanners is the images are slightly delayed from when the activity actually happens, meaning they have poor temporal resolution. This means it's hard to measure fast mental processes. A classic psychology study using PET scanner was a researcher called Tolving. Tolving wanted to investigate the connection between types of long-term memory and the brain's physical structure. Tolving injected a radioactive gold isotope into the bloodstream of six participants, including himself and his wife. This radioactive gold could be detected using the PET scanner. The participants were asked to recall either episodic or semantic long-term memories. 
What Tolving found with three of the participants was a consistent difference in blood flow when recalling semantic or episodic memories. When recalling episodic memories, activity was detected in areas of the frontal and temporal lobes, but activity was detected in the parietal and occipital lobes for semantic memories. So Tolving included semantic and episodic memory are separate processes using separate brain regions for processing. The use of an objective scientific measuring device, the PET scanner, under laboratory conditions provided strong evidence for Tolving's theories about long-term memory. These results are unlikely to be affected by researcher bias, extraneous variables or demand characteristics. We may question the sample used as only six participants is a small sample and included Tolving and his wife. Also, only three of those participants showed consistent results. So the results might not be representative. Those three people could have been unusual in how they process long-term memories. We can also question the validity of the task used in the experiment. It's very difficult to focus the mind on just one thought for any length of time. And taking a CT scan takes time. It might have been that participants found themselves getting distracted and then influencing the results. Finally, let's talk about neurological damage. This is when your brain's neurons are in some way destroyed. If that happens, you can lose the function that those neurons were responsible for. There are many ways that neurons can be damaged or destroyed, but two ways are strokes, which can happen when a blood vessel bursts in the brain, releasing blood, or a clot blocks the blood supply to the brain, or physical damage. So a direct impact on the brain can cause scarring, a lesion, Physical damage can also be caused by the effects of a disease on the brain. So problems that can be caused by neurological damage will be related to the area that's damaged. So let me explain this. Motor abilities are how we move our body. If the motor cortex is damaged, then this can cause paralysis of the part of the body that that section of the motor cortex controls. Well, keep in mind, the brain is contralateral, so damage to the motor cortex will cause paralysis on the opposite side of the body. Behaviours, the actions that we take, are regulated from a wide range of areas in the brain. Two examples are the frontal lobe, that controls decision making, and areas of the limbic system, that produce emotional responses. Damage to these areas can change behaviour. Now we cover the content, you need to be able to use all that information to actually answer questions. Here are five questions that I've created to test your skill. So pause the video and give them a go. And for those of you who support me on Patreon, I put together an additional bonus video showing you how to answer these questions properly. For everybody else, thanks for watching, liking, subscribing, and I'll see you in the next video, starting the new unit, Psychological Problems, Mental Health.